So I was recently asked, Fritz, what is your greatest Dungeons and Dragons achievement? I've had a great, great time playing D and D through various editions. I, I've gone on record publicly saying I liked D and D Fourth Edition. I'm loving Fifth, but I still like to go back and play a D and D. Uh, three point five, I, I enjoy, but I find the min max uh, a little bit too much, and I kind of get my three point five, three point oh, three point X fix through Neverwinter Nights. That that kind of takes care of that when I'm feeling exploring that system. But wherever we are in the D&D spectrum, there is that defining moment, that, that living memory experience that you remember for eternity that is, is really, really something special. And it might be one thing, it might be a few things. This, uh, as a side note, this led into the previous D&D vlog I posted where one of the things that I try to be mindful of as uh, a person playing D&D for a long time from the perspective of a player, I don't want to ruin that first experience for brand new players. If we look at a hybrid group, so we've got three players that are veteran players, been playing 5, 10, 15, 20 years longer, and then we have new players. The challenge in a group like that, and I feel like the players have more, the, the veteran players have more of an obligation than almost the dungeon master themselves. Because from that perspective, imagine the first time a new player faces a dragon. That's, that's legendary or, or a beholder or a lich, or you're playing through the campaign. You're going to fight Tiamat like that unknown is amazing. You don't know how this is going to turn out. You don't necessarily know what's going to happen where if you're a veteran player, you're like, okay, a uh, great red dragon, Armor class, 32, hit points, uh, 180, X number of attacks, breath weapons save for half, spell resistance, magic ability, treasure type, Thacko, number of appearing, can summon this, can fly. Like You just know the stats um, from playing the game or as a DM. How the heck would your character know that? And I'm not going to bring in that meta and, and ruin that experience for the new players. I want to live. I want to level up. But I will play my character to the point of it's better the other players have a great time. It's better the other players have those memories. I, I've played enough d and I will continue to play enough d and But if the party wants to charge and I'm back to back with my fellow brother fighting, I'll charge that dragon if that's what they want to do. If they think they can take that dragon in battle glory, we'll go for it. Even though crunching the numbers meta-wise, I'm like, we're dead. We're in trouble. Like I would rather create that amazing memory then um, as we're pausing in the initiative chain to say, well, look, actually it has this many hit points and it's this and it's got its breath weapon coming and we don't have reflex save and we're going to get soaked for 86 points of damage and we don't have fire resistance and we don't have this. Like, I'm not going to ruin that. So from that perspective, jumping back to the vlog here, my most memorable moment, started playing AD&D, jumped into Redbox D&D for a while then jumped back to AD&D once they really started pumping out Kryn. And I, I spent a number of years um, in the Dragonlance setting, in the AD&D setting. Now, I'm pumped for fifth. If they're bringing back the Lance, I'm in, even though they're going to make it super easy, super auto win, and you're going to be godlike and there's no real way to die. That's my only complaint about fifth. It's too easy to play. But I understand AD&D, you know, it did some things well, but... Other things, it's like you get hit with a poison dart and you're just dead. And you're like, wait, what? Like character death was everywhere. So much so some of the character sheets actually had a will. You would write out a will on the back. Um, if you did that before adventuring, you could leave your magic items and you could leave some gold to the next of kin, a.k.a. your next character. D&D, AD &D back in the day, day was no baby cakes. And certainly that's not for everybody. But that was very formative when I'm jumping into Kryn, I'm jumping into the AD&D Dragonlance setting, and it was with a dungeon master who, out of all the games that I've played, such an amazing DM. Loved playing in his games, the, the charisma that he brought to the table, the theatrics, just, just everything really, really amazing. And even to this day, if you were like Fritz, top 20 adventures that you played, he, he's up there with like 80%. Um, so being able to play in Dragonlance, I loved that. Now I loved playing a magic user. You didn't even call them wizards. I was playing a magic user 
uh, in AD&D. And that was very, very interesting because you had low hit points, you had limited spells, you cast it and you're done. You leveled up. Um, experience points in AD&D were at different levels. So uh, a thief, 1,200, your next level. Wizard, 2,500. You needed a lot more experience. Uh, the idea was, and it didn't quite do it, but um, certain classes would be higher level versus classes that are lower level because they're more powerful through spells or abilities and what they can do as opposed to the current edition of D&D where just everyone levels up the same. So from that perspective, the wizard had... The magic user had a duality of you had low spells, and on top of that, it took forever to level up. Spells cost components. They took time to cast, and you had, like, virtually no hit points. Put that in the Dragonlance setting where magic was regulated. Um, Magic was a little bit rare. It it was out there, and it was controlled through the test of the Tower of High Sorcery. What's interesting in AD&D... If you were like a fifth or sixth level magic user, a.k.a. wizard, that was a big deal. That was really, really potent. Levels 8, 12, that that was godlike. It's not like 5.0 where it's just assumed you're going to – you're just assumed you're going to hit like level 15, level 20. Like I'm going to play an adventure. I'm going to level up per adventure. So to play a magic user and make it to third or fourth level, that that had some bite. When you could cast Fireball or Lightning Bolt, you know you arrived. I mean, this was the, the perception at the time. So to play in Dragonlance and make it to third level, at that point, the idea was you have a magical aptitude, level zero, level one, you learn some magic, maybe you had a, a, a mentor or a tutor, maybe you self-taught, you go on adventures, you learn some more. Well, now at third level, you have to take the, the test at the Tower of High Sorcery. Because the magical orders, um, whether it was the white robes, the red robes, or the black robes, good, evil, neutral, they've taken notice. And you could go the way of the brown robes, meaning you don't align with one of these, and you can kind of cast any spells and kind of be a rogue magic user, but you're going to be hunted. You're not going to be tolerated, and you're not going to have the protection or the support of the order that you pick. So I wasn't going to go in that direction because the the DM is a great DM. Things were hard enough in AD&D. I don't need that type of target on my back. And all the wizards in Kryn kind of know each other, and you have alignment and secret languages. So it's not like I could throw on some some red robes and pretend I'm part of that order. Like, no, uh, they would notice. So I had to make a decision, and Dragonlance didn't play into this decision because there was a time when everyone was part of the red robed order and then a novel later they switched to the black robes i went in with the red because i liked the spell selection and i like the ability to kind of um, navigate that middle path so i have to take the test outside of the game so the dm says to me you know fritz i'm gonna write this test of tower high sorcery for you I'm bringing in two other players that they're not taking the test with you because they're not magic users, but the narrative is going to be like they're going with you to the tower. They've also been summoned. They're going to be a part of the test in some way, but they don't know how that's going to be. So we're all going to be taking this test together, and I'm I'm going to need about two weeks to write an adventure up. Um, And I don't know if you're going to pass the test. He's like, I'm going to write it up. We're going to play it, and uh, even if you're on top of everything, there's a good chance your character might die. And he's and my friend D is like, "Look, this is your last chance. Do you want to be a brown robe? Do you want to go rogue? Do you want to do this?" I'm like, you know, at that moment, I'm like, I had invested because this is AD and D. I invested a tremendous amount of time into playing this character, probably eight months real time, doing my best not to get killed doing my best to maximize. You know, I had 16 um, intelligence. I'm getting that bonus. I'm, I'm saving up all my gold to buy scrolls because you don't automatically get new abilities as you level up. Like, I'm doing everything right. And I'm like, do I literally want to gamble this in the moment? I felt I had to. So going into that test itself uh, was a lot of excitement, a lot of tension in a good way. And that during that week, like I was psyching myself up. I'm looking at my character sheet. 
I'm like, you know, we're going to do this. I'm talking with the two other players, their characters outside of the game where it's like, look, I'm going to need you guys to, to back me up. I'm not that I want you to sacrifice your life, but you know, we need to have a plan going in here because I, I want to pass this test. And it was an amazing adventure. One that I think of to this day. And I did pass. I, I, I passed pretty well now becoming part of the red robed order. And in such a strange way, in such a strange way, maybe that only D and D enthusiasts can understand that was one of like one of the top achievements in my life. And, and that seems crazy even to say that at this point. Like I've had um, a lot of professional success. I've had a lot of success in um, other gaming areas like Warhammer 40,000. I've had the good fortune to be a part of many wonderful initiatives where I can look back and say like, hey, I'm proud. We did some really good work here. Somehow mixed into that matrix is like passing some made up test in some made up game. Like, I'm really, really proud of that. Like, I'm very, very proud of that perspective. So that is one of the most memorable D&D moments. If I had to pick the number one, that would be it. And switching back originally, that's what I try to replicate as a DM to my players. And we're we're actually starting up a new campaign, tabletop campaign, where it's going to be three veteran players, myself included as a player, playing a druid. Haven't played a druid in a long time. Wasn't planning to play a druid, but that's just how the stats worked out. Um, but we have three brand new players. They've been playing D&D for like a couple of months. I'm not going to spoil anything. I'm going in there like whatever they want to do, even if it's not tactically correct. Because if I can give them as a player, and if I can give them as someone who Dungeons and Dragons has given me so much, if I can give that to them and create help create those memories, it's all good. That's what I want to do. And I feel like um, as part of the D&D community, that's, that's where we want to be. And that's what this amazing game is about. 